to start today's webinar. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Jitendra. Uh, Jitendra, uh, so today we'll be discussing the topic of deferral gases, which is an important topic, you know. It's important for two reasons. Uh, firstly, you know, chiefly because you are you, you need to be able to work up your patients well in order to relieve their symptoms. Uh, because uh, you need to uh, take care of their acute symptoms. They would have pain, hematuria, and so on. But the important thing, you know, for pediatricians and for many of us is that very often there is an underlying cause. And uh, there is an old adage, you know, that don't leave any stone unturned. So one should always try to find out the underlying cause for a stone. Having said that, you know, it's a tough job. In fact, uh, uh, when you look at our own experience over the years, you know, picking up, a, picking up the underlying cause has always been tough. And it really depends on your intensity of evaluation. Um, so one, but one has to focus. So I think the, the, the message is that every stone in a child should be evaluated. You just can't say this is this is this does not require evaluation. Because very often you will pick up conditions that are treatable. And because if you don't treat those conditions, the stones may still come out or be operated on and they would still recur. So keeping this in mind, I think we'll now begin with two excellent talks. We we are from Dr. Eliza Mittal, who is a associate professor of pediatrics at Ames Jodhpur. And Dr. And, and Dr. Kinnery Pavala, who is also an associate professor at the Institute of Kidney Disease and Research Center in Ahmedabad. Both are excellent speakers, and I'm sure they are going to add on to what you already know, as well as give you a lot of new information. Thank you very much, Jitin. Over to uh, Elisa. Thank you, sir, for the uh, for the vivid introduction to the requirement why we need to know about these renal stones. So at the, at the outset, I'd like to thank ISPN for giving me this opportunity to be presenting in front of this great audience. And uh, before, uh, without wasting any further time, I'll share my screen. Sorry, Elisa, you're additional professor. I'm so sorry. So this just happened last week, so. Sorry, sorry. okay. So, uh, are my slides visible, uh, sir? Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So, so, let us start with the approach to nephrolithiasis. And it gives me an immense pleasure to be presenting this topic because I'm actually sitting in an important stone belt of our country, the Western Rajasthan, the desert region of uh, Jodhpur, where we get uh, a large number of patients with nephrolithiasis. So, uh, we all know that the incidence of childhood nephrolithiasis is just about 10% of what we see in adults and uh, primarily seen predominantly in the Western countries, more in the Americas and lesser in the Europe's and further less in the Eastern part of the world. But there is a endemic stone belt in the northern part of Africa and also in the desert regions of Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan and it extends up to India. The reasons could vary. The, 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 the climate is hot, dry, and there is a high incidence of consanguinity, which also contributes to high prevalence of tubular disorders in these regions. And in populations like that in North India, the oxalobacter formigenous is absent from the gut, which is an intestine degrading bacteria, and therefore contributes to absorptive hyperoxaluria. It has been seen that the incidence of nephrolithiasis is increasing by about 4% per calendar year. And the type of stone varies in various types of economies. So in more developed countries, we see more prevalence of calcium oxalate and phosphate stones. Whereas in a country like ours, it's more it's the uric acid or the ammonium stones which are more commonly seen. And these are the various types of stones. So like I said, it is the calcium oxalate, phosphate, and the calcium oxalate dehydrate stones, which are the most common, followed by the mixed type of calcium oxalate or phosphate stones. Then we have the less common ones like the uric acid, the cysteine, the ammonium urate, or the other types of stones in these, uh, in the types of stones that we see in pediatric patients. So this is important that we be able to identify the stone from their morphology or the crystals that are seen in the urine examination, which is usually the first investigation available to us when we see a child with stones. So in the panel uh, A, we can see a typical hexagonal cysteine stone, 
we can also see a coffin lid appearance of a, a, a struvite crystal. Then in panel C and D, they are birefringent stones of uh, a pyramid shape and a dumbbell shape seen in calcium oxalate stones. And then the uric acid stones, which are rectangular in shape. So why do stones form? One has a genetic predisposition. And on top of that, there could be some acquired metabolic defects. And then there are dietary lifestyle factors which contribute to formation of stones. So there will be an increased excretion of stone forming constituent in the urine, along with decreased inhibitors of crystallization, all of which contribute to formation of crystals because when the urine is supersaturated, the, these, all these factors, they get together and lead to aggregation of the crystals. Gradually, the crystal grows and the formation of stones take place. So there are numerous risk factors for renal stones in children like dehydration, use of high sodium, dietary factors, vitamin D excess, so on and so forth. But what is more important is to know about the reduced inhibitors in the renal, uh, in the patient's urine, which leads to formation of stones. So these could be the reduced magnesium or citrate in the urine, absence of tan horseful proteins, nephrocalcin or uropontin, which are all responsible for reducing the incidence of, urine, uh, of uh, renal stones and the urine pH. So there are certain stones which would form in an acidic urine like the uric acid or the cysteine stones and there are other stones like calcium phosphate which are important in when the urine pH is alkaline. So why it is important to know the risk factors is because there is a if you don't treat the stone there is a risk of almost 50 percent recurrence within the first seven years after the first episode of colic. This was a study from South India uh, published about two years back and in, it involved around 72 patients and they described various metabolic causes that they, dis, uh, that they found in their cohort of 72 patients of renal stones. Apart from primary causes, one can see a large number of secondary causes like urinary tract malformations, obesity, chronic bowel diseases. And if the patient has been bedridden for a long time because of certain neurological diseases, it could all lead to increased oxalate absorption and therefore hyperoxaluria. So in a nutshell, the four important metabolic factors which may contribute to stone formation are hypercalciuria, hyperoxaluria, hyperuricosuria, and hypocitraturia. Uh, the most important amongst these is hypercalciuria and about 45% of these patients would have a family history and they can be associated with increased oxalate excretion as well. I think it has been extensively covered in the previous topics, the, the, the etiology and pathophysiology of how hypercalciuria happens and uh, its relationship to tubular disorders. Coming to hyperoxaluria, this could be primary because of endogenous overproduction or secondary to an oxalate load in the diet. Uh, this could also be because of increased uh, resorption in states of malabsorption, Crohn's disease, uh, short gut syndrome, so on and so forth. The solubility of calcium oxalate would be reduced in conditions where the patient also has hyperuricosuria, hypercalciuria. That means there are, if there are other factors which are contributing to stone formation, hyper, the oxalate solubility also reduces and therefore it becomes an important component of the stone itself. Hyperuricosuria may be observed in certain myeloproliferative disorders and certain metabolic disorders and Elevated dietary purine and protein intake may also contribute to increased uric acid excretion in the urine. An important inhibitor of stone formation, that is citrate, and if it's absent in the urine, is associated with increased calcium excretion and oxalate excretion. It may be associated with distal RTA, hypokalemia, and high protein diet. So a systemic metabolic acidosis or hypokalemia may also contribute to hypocitraturia, which is an inhibitor of urinary stones. So the patient may remain asymptomatic, a small baby may present with inconsolable cry and a larger child with a renal colic. The recent study from Ames Daily has shown that abdominal pain was the primary presenting feature in almost 87% of the patients of renal stones who were evaluated in their study. Some of the patients may present with acute renal failure or with complete urinary retention. So how do you manage them? In acute cases, it's important uh, to first um, elevate the pain and relieve the patient of the acute condition. So I've just divided this into the investigation part and the treatment part. So let's first start with the investigations. The first and the foremost is a urine microscopy, either of an uncentrifuged urine, and we can do a urine culture and antibiogram in there. A plain abdominal radiography to look for a radiopaque stone or a urinary tract ultrasound. 
In case the stone is not visible on an ultrasound, one can go for a non-contrast CT. The CT would also help us delineate the clear anatomy in case a surgery has to be planned. Further migration of the stone can then be followed by an ultrasound. As far as the treatment in acute conditions is concerned, if one is suspecting an infection, antibiotics become the treatment of choice and surgical intervention in case it is indicated and I'll be discussing that briefly in a short while. Now coming to the metabolic evaluation of renal stones. So this is why the entire background that I had been just talking about. Why do we need to do a metabolic evaluation of renal stones and how do we go about it? We start with taking the family history, build a pedigree and look for prevalence of stones in any first degree relatives. And after that only we proceed to the laboratory tests. So this is how I've summarized the list of laboratory tests. It is said that we can start with the ratios, that is the spot urinary sample to look for the, um, the metabolites and their ratios in the spot urinary collection. And if we find something abnormal in that, we can go for a 24-hour urine collection. We can do it once for, uh, for metabolites like oxalates and amino acids, but at least two to three collections are required for metabolites like sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, phosphate, magnesium, uric acid and citrate, because these are going to be really affected by the amount of fluid that the patient is going to take. So a single value should not be, uh, you know, jumped upon to make conclusions. We should always take at least two to three different uh, sets of measurements before we make any particular conclusion. These are the blood investigations and the urine microscopic examination. Now, what is important here is that these examinations and investigations should not be performed immediately after an acute stone episode, surgery or an infection. A cooling period of at least four to six weeks should be given once the patient has been on a normal fluid and dietary intake and only then these investigations should be performed. This is a list of normal values of urinary metabolites and they're available in most of the textbooks. So I'd like to focus on this important slide. Once we have the results of our blood and urine evaluation, we can have one of these above five situations. There can be an abnormality in the uric acid. The citrate could be low. We can find hypercalciuria, hyperoxaluria, or there may be some other defect. So let us start with the most common abnormality that we find in a urine evaluation, that is hypercalciuria, seen in up to 50% of the patients. In a condition of hypercalciuria, we now need to know what is the patient's calcium and the pTH. And once we have those values, a patient, the most common scenario would be normal calcium and a normal pTH level. And these are the various conditions that we can think of when you, once we have hypercalciuria in the setting of normal calcium and normal pTH. If the calcium is low, autosomal dominant hypercalciuric hypocalcemia should be thought of. But if the calcium is high in the presence of normal pTH, Williams syndrome should be considered. In conditions where the pTH is high, uh, familial hyper, uh, hypocalcemic hypercalciuria or hyperparathyroidism in the presence of high calcium should be considered. And if the PTH is reduced, in the presence of low calcium, one should think of hypoparathyroidism or vitamin D hypersensitivity in case of high calcium content. The other abnormality that we commonly see is the abnormal uric acid. So either one can have a high urinary uric acid or a low urinary uric acid in the presence of high serum or a low serum uric acid level. So if both urinary as well as serum uric acid is low, Hereditary, hyper, hereditary xanthinuria should be suspected, whereas if both are high, it is usually due to increased cell turnover like in malignancies. In the presence of high urinary uric acid but low serum uric acid, we suspect renal tubular disorders. And if there is high serum uric acid with low urinary values, medullary cystic kidney disease and familial juvenile hyperuricemic nephropathy should be considered. Low citrate itself is a, a metabolic abnormality which may contribute to stone formation. Now coming to hyperoxaluria, which is seen in about 10% of these patients. In these patients, we assess for any dietary risk factors. If we find any, we consider it to be a secondary hyperoxaluria. But in children, uh, primary hyperoxaluria should always be considered. And to confirm that, one may need to do a plasma oxalate level or do genetics. Now, why genetics in pediatric nephrolithiasis? There has been a recent interest and a recent upsurge of papers on genetics in pediatric nephrolithiasis, some of which I've tried to collect here. So there are certain genes which are sensitive to treatment. For example, in primary hyperoxaluria, a disease which otherwise does not have a very good prognosis and patient usually progresses to end-stage renal disease quite early. 
there are two variants of this uh, of this uh, defect which are sensitive to pyridoxin and therefore may lead to better outcomes in these patients so it's important that we know what is the exact genetic variant of the patient that we are dealing with genetic evaluation also has a high, a high yield and once you have a specific diagnosis certain disorders can be treated in a specific manner this was a, a study from seven centers in Europe on 130 participants, which has uh, emphasized that genetic testing does have a high yield in identifying the etiology of nephrolithiasis and nephrocalcinosis, and it should be used more often than it is being currently used. So what are these genetic causes of kidney stones? If you have radiolucent stones of uric acid, one may suspect APRT deficiency, that is alanine uh, that is the adenosine phosphoribosyl transferase defect. A hexagonal cysteine stone can lead to diagnosis of cysteinuria type A, type B or type AB, uh, which are again important as far as the prognosis and treatment is concerned. Familial hypercalciuria, hypomagnesemia and nephrocalcinosis may be suspected in patients who present with uh, these uh, metabolic disorders and these could be because of the defective claudins. Dense disease, I'm sure, has been discussed in the previous lectures. Then coming back to the topic we were discussing in the previous slide, that is hyperoxyluria, which is of three types. The type 1, which has the worst prognosis. Type 2 has a lesser incidence of, prog uh, of uh, progression to ESRD. And type 3, which will be discussed by uh, Dr. Kinnery shortly during the presentation of the cases. And there can be, because uh, it is important to identify them, because there are specific medications for these conditions. Uh, the most important approach to managing them would be redu reduction of oxalate-rich food, calcium intake of around 800 to 1200 milligrams per day, reduction of sodium and increase of potassium to more than 120 milligrams per day, and increasing citrate and fluid intake. Apart from this, each condition is amenable to a specific medication like thiazides for hypercalciuria, use of magnesium and sequential liver kidney transplant for patients with hyperoxaluria, D-penicillamine thiopronin for cysteine stones and lowering the urine pH in patients with uric acid stone and use of xanthine oxidase inhibitors in patients with uric acid nephropathy. So when do we need to start medications in patients with stone disease? First is an acute condition. Let us discuss what is the medical expulsive therapy. So we use alpha blockers or calcium channel blockers which help to relax the ureteral smooth muscle and enlarge the distal one-third of the ureter and a recent meta-analysis has shown that alpha antagonists are, uh, are associated, use of alpha antagonists are associated with better rates of stone expulsion and they are effective and safe for uh, use in children as well. So you can use uh, medical expensive therapy for non-obstructed small stones of less than one centimeter and lying within the distal part of the ureter. For acute pain, one can use NSAIDs, otherwise other drugs like calcium channel blockers, steroids, morphine analogs can be used. One has to monitor renal functions and make sure that adequate hydration, which leads to a urine flow of at least 1 ml per kg, uh, should be maintained. However, one should not exceed 2 liters because there is a risk of obstructed uropathy as well. Uh, one should instruct the patient to look for a passage of urine and 60 to 70 percent of the stones are likely to pass spontaneously. Before jumping on to pharmacological measures, it is important that non-pharmacological measures be emphasized on. The most important is adequate hydration and which again uh, ensures a urine flow of 1 ml per kg or ideally 2 to 3 ml per kg per day. But this should be distributed well throughout the day and half of it should be water. Now we need to be very cautious about beverages as the patient may ask that beverages may be good or bad. But there are certain pro-lithogenic beverages like apple and grapefruit which contain phosphoric acid and they are pro-lithogenic and therefore should be avoided. These are the specific dietary interventions which should be advised to children. The sodium and potassium intake should be according to recommended dietary intake and we can monitor it by doing a urinary sodium potassium ratio and which should be maintained below 2.5. Reduction of animal-derived protein, although there is an argument that this would lead to reduced growth rates in children, but increasing the plant-derived protein is definitely uh, going to reduce the, long, uh, the risk of uh, hyperoxaluria. Use of sugars, sucrose or fructose, ascorbic acid, uh, they predispose to obesity and therefore hypercalciuria and hyperoxaluria. Magnesium and phytates overall impair calculus formation and therefore they are good for patients with renal stones. 
there are some some common dietary mistakes that are made like uh, elimination of tomatoes elimination of dairy products chocolates and teas so they are not this is not needed one can continue uh, eating them but uh, foods containing high oxalate like spinach rhubarb brown rice berries and dark teas should be avoided and so should be ascorbic acid now when do we call in the surgeons any stone which is presenting to us with complete obstruction urosepsis solitary kidney deterioration of renal function or intractable symptoms should be amenable should be uh, referred to for a surgical intervention however if you have a stone in the proximal part of the uh, ureter with a diameter of more than 5 mm or in the distal part of the ureter with a diameter of more than 7 mm should also be referred for surgical intervention and what do they do the first choice for a surgical intervention is the shock wave lithotripsy however again there are concerns regarding the long term effects of shock wave on the developing kidney in children for larger stones like the staghorn calculi or a stone measuring more than 15 mm one could resort to a percutaneous nephrolithotomy and if you have a stone lying in the distal part of the ureter a ureteroscopic retrieval of the stone may also be performed so coming to the last part of uh, the talk how do we follow up these patients and why is follow up essential it is essential because we have to curb the risk of recurrence which i have already stated is to the tune of almost 50% so it is simple we can just do an ultrasound scan at 4 weeks after the surgery and then we can follow up these patients about 3 to 6 monthly and then urine examination uh, to look for presence of crystals and stones can be done uh in certain cases we can also look for urinary excretion of metabolites sodium and potassium ratios and monitor the urine ph but at the end it is important to note that metabolic evaluation is a must for all children who are presenting with a, a stone event genetics should be offered to all patients and targeted therapy should be towards fluid and diet along with the other uh, the, the pharmacological measures and follow up is very important and it should be emphasized to all the patients who are being treated for renal stones thank you sir thank you audience for the patient listening thank you eliza thank you for the excellent overview of the topic i'll now so we'll have questions at the end as before so we'll i'll now call upon dr kinnari vella from uh, was a faculty at the ikr ik rdc in ahmedabad to talk about the case based management of children with stones so uh, she'll be discussing uh, individual cases and uh, kinri can you uh, can you begin thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction uh, sir uh, are my slides visible now yes yes but you need to go to the slide show mode yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much uh, uh, the organizers for uh, considering me to discuss such a, a great topic which we see uh, in rajasthan as well as gujarat uh, uh, very uh, regularly and without much ado i will start uh, today the topic is case based discussion on renal stones in children our first case is 3 year old boy antenatally detected to have ecogenic kidneys was uh, full term lscs delivered with good birth weight presented to our hospital with complaints of gross hematuria one episode urine was bright red in color passage of urine was painful child was having painful micturition however there was no history suggestive of any uh, glomerular etiology of the gross hematuria Uh, no history of beetroot inject ingestion but there was significant family history of renal stone to father uncles and grandfather also grandfather required nephrectomy because of these stones at age of 35 years which is very young and died at age of 76 years due to eskd that is end stage kidney disease on presentation child was alert playful apparently hearing and vision was normal no other grossly detected anomalies genitals were also normal anthropometry wise child was well grown on basic investigation urine routine micro showed some amount of protein urea with plenty of rbcs and few pus cells however there were no cast seen baseline ultrasound examination was done which was suggestive of borderline uh, enlarged kidneys which is not called as uh, bulky kidneys but it was borderline on the higher side and 2.5 mm renal calculus was seen at left upper calyx detail evaluation for that calculus was done 
hemogram was absolutely normal. Creatinine was 0.29 milligram per deciliter. Normal electrolytes, no acidosis. Calcium was 11.2, slightly on the higher side. Vitamin D3 was 35 and PTH was 23.9. Uric acid was 3.8, which was normal. So further uh, evaluation was done. Urine spot calcium creatinine ratio was done, which was 0.46, which is borderline high for the age. So 24-hour urinary collection was done as discussed and described by madam in the previous uh, presentation. For any 24-hour urinary uh, collection, we need to uh, see creatinine value, which should be more than 10 or between 10 to 15 mg per kg per day. For him, 24-hour urinary calcium was 4 mg per kg per day, which is high for the child. So here clues were non-glomerular hematuria with significant family history in a well-grown child without any associated comorbidities. So diagnosis was benign idiopathic hypercalciuria, which is commonly seen in uh, uh, children. Treatment for benign idiopathic hypercalciuria is mainly salt restriction, liberal fluids as discussed by madam, potassium and citrate supplements. Avoid or reduce animal protein. However, it may not be possible uh, always if a uh, uh, patient is from a, a non-vegetarian uh, eating family. Also, in these kids, we need to carefully monitor resolution of uh, hypercalciuria or decrease in uh, excretion of calcium. If it is not reduced with above supportive measures, then we may need to add uh, thiazide. A little bit about citrate supplement. Citrate generally comes with in a potassium citrate salt or a sodium citrate salt. Potassium citrate, various brands are available, most widely used are portrait, casit, etc., which has 2 MEQ of potassium and 3 MEQ of citrate in each ml. So the dose is to be uh, uh, seen and then uh, given to children because hyperkalemia may uh, lead the, to, uh, in specifically in patients of obstructing stones. It is mainly used for hypercalciuria and alkalization of urine. Sodium citrate also uh, is available, which is 1 mq of sodium and 2 mq of citrate in each ml, which is mainly used for uric acid stones. However, here we need to uh, be very cautious because we are going to give sodium, which may uh, uh, increase stone formation because of the increased calcium excretion. Move on to second case, 13-month-old female child, fourth by birth order had very significant uh, consanguinity in the family. However, this is not a complete family tree, but there is definitely two uh, generations where consanguinity is there, third degree consanguinity. Elder brother was also operated for renal stone four times and parent paternal uncle also had history of stone. This child presented to us with anuria for three days. So immediately uh, acute peritoneal dialysis was started. Bedside ultrasound was done, which was suggest showing only a uh, single kidney uh, that is right single functioning kidney with left MCBK. Right kidney also had 15 mm calculus at PU junction, that is pi, uh, junction with hydronephrosis and internal echoes. So uh, child was uh, operated, urgent PCN diversion was done at bedside and child was also started on antibiotics in view of internal echoes, possibility of infection. After 10 days of stabilization, uh, mini PERC, which is a, a percutaneous nephrolithotomy by a urologist with DJ stenting was done and removed stone fragments were sent for uh, stone analysis. After stabilization, removal of stone uh, before discharge, wo basic workup was done where uh, normal hemogram except mild anemia was there. Creatinine was 0.22. Now creatinine has uh, uh, come to baseline with normal electrolytes, no acidosis normal calcium phosphorus, however, very low uric acid, which is 0.2, which is almost undetectable. Her urine RM now was showing 10 to 12 percel, 6 to 8 RBCs, no proteinuria, culture was no growth, and spot calcium creatinine ratio was normal for the age. Meanwhile, we also received renal stone analysis, which was showing xanthin. 85 percentage of uh, stone formation was by xanthin. So whole exome sequencing was done, which was suggestive of XTH homozygous mutation, pathogenic in nature, which will cause xanthinuria type 1. Here, clinical cues were significant consanguinity in the family, family history of renal stones, child presented at very young age with obstructing stone. Also, timely reported stone analysis uh, made it possible to reduce further workup. So our diagnosis here was hereditary xanthinuria. What is hereditary xanthinuria? It is a deficiency of xanthin oxidase, which is required to convert hypoxanthin to xanthin and xanthin to uric acid. 
So this will lead to decrease in uric acid in serum as well as urine. So there will be hypouricemia as well as hypouricosuria and increased xanthine in urine leading to xanthine stone, stone formation. Treatment of hereditary xanthine urea is alkalinization of urine and maintain hydration. Here important thing is that child has single functioning kidney and with a hereditary condition. So this child needs specific uh, strict follow-up to uh, prevent further stone formation. Moving on to third case, 18 month old female child, full turn normal delivered 3.5 kg without any antenatal diagnosis on eventful perinatal period at four months of age presented with red urine or red diapers diagnosed to have 4 mm calculus at right upper calyx. So consulted to primary pediatricians and some symptomatic treatment was given. Father also has history of stone, but he never required surgery. At six months of age, child had complaint of fever, vomiting, lethargy. Child was admitted, diagnosed to have culture proven UTI and thorough workup for UTI was done by uh, the local pediatricians. Ultrasound was done, which was suggestive of uh, hydronephrosis more on the right side than the left side. MCU was done. I do not have the uh, uh, plates, but this is the re this is reported by the radiologist where it was showing bilateral grade four VUR. DMS scan was also done, which was showing one scar in the uh, left kidney upper pole. And this child was started on uroprophylaxis, and other UTI prevention measures were also explained to the child. However, in 2021, at 18 months of age, child was diagnosed to have renal stone again. So, child was referred to IKDRC. At IKDRC, child was well grown and basic ultrasound was done, which was suggestive of 15 mm calculus in the middle calyx without causing any hydronephrosis. Basic investigation was suggestive of some pus cells in the urine, no RBCs. Culture was positive and the organism was sensitive to meropenem. CT uh, KUB was also done because of the radiologist uh, confusion. So 15 mm size calculus was also detected in CT KUB. Her urine spot calcium creatinine ratio was way low or normal uh, than the what we expect in expected hypercalciuria. So child was not having hypercalciuria. So further workup was done, which was showing normal hemogram, normal creatinine, normal electrolytes, no acidosis. Calcium 10 borderline phosphorus, alkaline phosphorus, vitamin D3 borderline normal, normal uric acid and CRP was negative. So child was also not having significant UTI. So ESWL was done uh, by urologist and stone was sent for analysis, which turned out to be cysteine in 95% of the stone content. And so the whole exome sequencing was done, which was suggestive of uh, SLC3A1, which is cysteine urea type 1, will lead to uh, cysteine stones, likely pathogenic homozygous uh, 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 mutation was identified. So here the clues were no significant clues in the history, but second time stone formation in a child is to be taken seriously and should be evaluated further. So we could diagnose a child with cysteine urea with bilateral grade 4 VUR. So what is cysteine urea? It is, a, it is different, one of the rare disorder and it is not cystinosis. Here, child will have a specific transport defect and it will impair proximal tubular reabsorption of the cystine, resulting in increased urinary cystine excretion. Management for cystine urea is generally supportive in form of increased fluid intake, reduced salt and animal protein in diet. These children will require uh, uh, for the uh, 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 resolution of the cystine stones, but they will need a very high pH or very high, very uh, alkaline urine. So they may need a higher dose of uh, citrate. And if it is not resolving with that, then the thiol containing drugs, the most widely available is D-penicillamine is uh, used. These patients are strictly to be monitored for cystine excretion. Best if we can do quantification. Uh, uh, quantification in 24-hour urine. If we cannot do, then we should check the uh, uh, urine for crystals or sodium nitroprusside test in freshly passed urine. Moving on to fourth case, six-month-old female child, first by birth order, no significant family history, uh, good uh, uh, antenatal perinatal histories. However, at two months of age, child was uh, presented with multiple stone on both the sides. So bilateral digestenting with litho lithotomy was done and sto somehow stone was not sent for the analysis. Child required two more such procedures in next six months. 
and now the stone analysis was sent which was showing calcium oxalate monohydrate 80 percentage of stone content was calcium oxalate monohydrate so after this stone analysis uh, child was referred to our opd for metabolic workup because of the young age and three episodes of uh, surgical intervention required at 10 months of age, when child presented to us, child had borderline uh, low growth, that is uh, weight was 7.2 kg, which is minus 1.3 Z score and height was 70, 70 centimeter. This could be because of the multiple hospitalization also. Thorough workup was done. Urine routine micro was showing some amount of proteinuria, few pustules and plenty of RBCs. Urine culture was also growing some organism. Ultrasound was done. Still, child had two to three uh, calculus on both the sides, causing some amount of hydronephrosis. So, MZU was also done, which was not showing BUR. So, that possibility that a cacut can cause stone was also ruled out. Urine spot calcium creatinine ratio was 0.46, which is borderline. Generally, 0.5 or 0.6 is the cutoff. So, child was uh, further evaluated. Electrolytes were normal. Blood gas was showing mild metabolic acidosis at 10 months. However, we considered 19.8 as a normal bicarb. So, an anion gap was calculated, which was high. Calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D3, PTH was normal. Uric acid was also normal. So, these parents were counseled for 24-hour urinary collection, but parents were not ready to get admitted and uh, to have catheterized the child. So, they directly wanted to send the genome uh, sequencing, which was sent, which was showing uh, HOGA1 uh, mutation, which is responsible for primary hyperoxaluria type 3. It was, however, reported variants, variant of unknown significance, uncertain significance. And uh, uh, the report, why they, it was uh, reported like that? Because they said that in one of the database, it was reported as pathogenic, but the other database does not report it in thousand genome database. So they wanted the uh, Sangers as Sanger of the child also uh, sequencing in the parents, which could not be uh, followed up. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, this was not reported as pathogenic afterwards also. This is now post, uh, post uh, analysis. Now, three years, child does not have stone. Recurrent stone is not there. So, a few words about primary hyperoxylurias. They are rare disorders of glycosylate meta metabolism causing will cause increase in serum as well as urine oxalate levels. As Madam has described, three types are described so far. The primary hyperaxillary type 1, 2, and 3. 1 and 2, we have already gone into detail. I'll just speak on primary hyperaxillary type 3, which is a 4-hydroxy-2 oxoglutarate aldolase enzyme deficiency, which is least common among all three, which is least severe also. The presentation will be recurrent stone formation, and generally treatment is hydration, citrate, and regular follow-up. They will never progress to end-stage renal disease. However, type 1 and type 2 may progress to ESKD and required uh, uh, the transplant also. I would like to share our uh, protocol. That, that is how we generally evaluate our patients of stone. Give me a minute. So this is our protocol. We will take brief history of the. Uh, we will take brief history of the uh, child. Clinical presentation will be documented. Personal history, specifically of daily fluid intake, if possible in older kids. Drug intake, specifically in infants, where calcium and vitamin D supplements are given, and many a times parents may uh, give uh, higher doses than. Uh, prescribed. Family history is very important in renal stone, specifically consanguinity, history of renal stone in the family, if they have difficult conception, specifically in primary hyperoxaluria, where uh, uh, we, we may see that the conception has happened, but child died early at four or five months of age without knowing the cause. So this history is to be taken seriously. Anthropometry definitely is needed because of the uh, various other conditions like RTAs we need to see. Uh, we also see examination in form of um, uh, if there are signs of rickets, polydactyly is there, gouty joint or subcutaneous nodule, specifically in uric acid metabolism uh, defects there. Uh, we see uh, such kind of uh, 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 findings. Cataract history of surgery for cataract, specifically in low waste disease, if there are any kind of dysmorphism. Generally, we do investigation in form of urine routine micro, uh, urine culture, 
uh, not required in all cases, but uh, we may do it in few of the cases if there are internal echoes, history of fever, high CRP, then normal hemogram, creatinine is to be documented, sodium, potassium, chloride and magnesium, these four electrolytes along with uh, full uh, calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphorus, vitamin D3 and PTH workup, blood gas analysis. After that, we do spot urinary samples as described by madam. If it is showing any abnormality or if there is very high index of suspicion, then uh, we also do a 24-hour urinary collection. Uh, uh, a volume is important to document. Creatinine is important to see the adequate collection is done or not. Sodium, potassium, calcium. Calcium, uric acid, citrate and oxalate, these are four very important 24-hour urinary uh, uh, metabolites that we need to see. X-ray KUB, USG KUB is done. Stone analysis is very important as you have seen in previous cases. The most of the workup was not done because stone had uh, diagnosed and stone analysis had diagnosed that uh, uh, the content of the stone. So the next workup was not done and whenever required uh, uh, genetics is to be sent. So moving on to the uh, further uh, so my take home message will be, will be thorough evaluation is must for all stones in the children even if it is a first stone then also it should be worked up thoroughly once they reach to you stone analysis should always be done whenever possible genetics will help us guide specific treatment approach Timely diagnosis will help prevent further renal damage and we can also target specific therapy in early uh, phase. And few diseases like hyperoxaluria, FHHNC can progress to ESKD faster if they are not picked up timely. So for such diseases also, we need to diagnose them early. And thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wala, for an excellent presentation and talking about patients, you know, and uh, giving us about these four patients. I think your patients were extremely interesting and uh, clearly, you know, all of them had very early age of onset. I'm a bit curious, uh, Dr. Kendri, that in two patients, you know, you had a totally different, uh, so in one child had a MCDK on one side, a single kidney and we got xanthinuria. Now that's a bit odd, you know, uh, to have two diseases, but then as you have shown so clearly, you know, this may, this might happen. And the other one had cystinuria. So clearly, you know, but and he also had, he had bilateral VUR, which again yes. is uh, odd, you know, because uh, if, if it's, it's uh, the first message is that VUR does not, while we see so much VUR, you know, we don't see stone. So maybe in that sense, you're right, that perhaps the stone was not linked to VUR, but then theoretically VUR can cause stones perhaps, may yes. perhaps really But then you ended up getting cystinuria. So, uh, so do evaluate. But I would still think, you know, that the evaluation should be slightly more focused because doing vitamin D and everything, you know, everybody is perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps not necessary, you know, and we would perhaps do a set of screening tests initially and then focus on, uh, then based on their, on the results. If you go back to case one, uh, Dr. Kenry, with the, the fellow who had hypercalciuria, uh, how did we diagnose him to be having benign idiopathic hypercalciuria. Uska reason kya tha? Just, just show us the, yeah. If you can just show me the slides, yeah. That's because that would be the commonest thing yes. that uh, their doctors would be encountering. So it's a, it's good to talk to them. So just show us the basic evaluation. Yeah, so yeah, just uh, stop here. So uh, his hemoglobin, his uh, white cell count was okay. Creatine was fine. Electrolytes were fine. So that's important. And uh, the bica was 20. Calcium was, level was normal. In fact, it was slightly high. Phosphate is also a bit high for the age. Uh, vitamin D3 is normal. And uh, PTH is okay. Uric acid is 3.8. Just carry on. Next slide. And then he had hypercalciuria. Uh, next slide. So my question to you is that if you get this kind of a picture, uh, yeah. what would you, uh, I would perhaps think, you know, and this is a message for people who are listening, that we would at least uh, 
look at the look at the uh, magnesium level closely because you could have a claudine problem presenting early so when one would look at, at a claudine 16 or a claudine 19 change so one would look at magnesium we would routinely also do thyroid hormone tests both for hypo as well as hyper because they can also cause hypercalciuria yes sir one, one would also look for uh, incomplete rta and uh, yes. therefore uh, because there is hypercalciuria so how would you exclude incomplete rta in this child so sir this child has been thoroughly i have not included the further workup this child has yeah. been thoroughly Ill, uh, uh, worked up for 24 hour urinary collection and rta was ruled out uh, in that my, my 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 question to you is how would you exclude inc incomplete rta in this child this child is 3 years old with significant hypercalciuria and the normal blood gas yes sir so how do you, how do you exclude incomplete rta sir by bicarbonate loading loading test we need to uh, do that Mm-hmm. Okay, Eliza, uh, what would be your evaluation, say, in somebody who has hypercalciuria and you're suspecting an incomplete RTA? So we would do a, a, a fluoromethylene fluorocortisone test, NFF test, to yeah. make sure that the yeah. acidification is happening or not. And we do that. So we call our patients early in the morning, do a early morning urine pH, and whenever there is a doubt, we rather run a NFF test and be sure that there is no uh, incomplete distal RTA in patients who have hypercalciuria. Yeah, so I would imagine, you know, that one would be looking at acidification. Bicarb loading test is a bit cumbersome. You're right, you know, one can even pick it up on a bicarb loading test, but hmm. bicarb loading test is a bit more cumbersome than the pyrosomite test. Okay, uh, Kindri, again, a question for you. How yes. long alkalinization is continued in a patient? In this child, sir. Yeah, no, no, long, no uh, any patient. This is a question by the, audi uh, by the audience. Okay, sir. So for once the cases, decide, so, yeah, once you decide to start, how long do you continue? So, sir, once the uh, patient has been diagnosed to have some hereditary disorder, then we need to give them uh, lifelong. Uh, like uh, patients of uh, cystinuria, they may need a further therapy also, like deep penicillamine and all. But patients of hypercalciuria, after a period of some time, their fluid intake may increase. Then their diet is salt restriction is already there. Then we may not need to may, may not give them the further citrate. Uh, as a supplement, rather they can modify their diet in general and they don't need further. Absolutely, I would agree with you, you know, but we would initially give it for, for a while, yes, especially the, one, the ones who are recurrent stone formers. And uh, so, and the, the target really is a pH of about 7.5. Um, the only exception to this is uh, high uric acid. So, uh, so if you are, if you have uric acid stones, then one avoids uh, high urine pH. But other than uric acid, you know, every every other situation one can use uh, bicarb or citrate, sorry, not bicarb, citrate with a target urine pH of about 7.5. Uh, there's another question uh, now, I don't know whether either of you can answer, which are the centers in eastern part of India doing stone analysis? Even in North India, you know, I'm, perhaps I can answer this, even in North India, there are not too many centers who are doing it, but all the major labs, so for example, the Lalpath, as well as, you know, even the other labs, uh, they are doing it, you know. The, the, I'm forgetting the other names, but all the major labs would have a stone panel. And in addition to the stone panel, they can also do stone analysis. So that it is it is possible. Uh, and uh, the only thing, so always send whatever stones you get, do send a stone for evaluation. There's another question, uh, Eliza, for you this time. Most cases discussed in case scenario have done whole exome sequencing but that is not available or affordable at 99% of the government hospitals. So that means, are we missing all these cases of genetic diagnosis, Eliza? Uh, <clears throat> sir, a lot of these uh, genetic disorders would have some of the other metabolic pointers, provided the metabolic evaluation is done properly. For example, for FHHNC, we need to look at a proper serum magnesium, a proper urine yeah. examination to look for urine crystals. Jitendra would agree with me. We had a patient where we could really see urine crystals on urine examination itself. And uh, we could uh, diagnose cystinuria in that patient just on examination of the urine itself. So, uh, I would totally a... agree. Uh, yeah, I would totally agree with you. I, I would, uh, Eliza, sorry, you were Yeah, Thanks. so, uh, yeah. sir, for example, even for xanthinuria, we recently had a patient who had a zero serum uric acid level. Although the final diagnosis was made on the stone analysis, but then simple pointers on even metabolic evaluation would give us an idea that these are the patients who really require a genetic evaluation. 
Yes, patients who've got mixed type of stones like calcium oxalate, phosphate, triple phosphates, and those type of patients, maybe we are uh, missing out on certain genetic etiologies when we are not doing when we don't get any specific uh, metabolic point. I would yes. totally agree with you. In fact, we just had a thesis that finished in which, uh, uh, in fact, Jitendra was involved, uh, in which they were looking at the etiology of stones. And uh, I must tell you that we could find the etiology by based on metabolic evaluation in about 55-60% by adding genetics to the to the whole. So all kids went uh, underwent metabolic evaluation. They also underwent genetics. But pure metabolic evaluation, we could get a diagnosis in about 55%. By adding genetics, you could get a diagnosis in just about 10% more. So while genetics has to be encouraged uh, and it's going to get cheaper, you know, we should try to get it done to pick up that extra 10%. Metabolic evaluation, if it is done in the right way, can pick up the majority of patients. And as uh, Dr. Uh, showed, even in the cases later, you know, cysteine area was picked up on the cysteine store evaluation and so on, you know. So it's uh, metabolic evaluation has a very important role to play, but it has to be thorough and it has to be, you know, directed, you know, you just can't do it for the heck of doing it. You should know what you're looking at. Uh, there's another question, Kindry, for you this time. Any role of post alkaline diuresis? So, uh, as Madam has described, that uh, in the upper ureter there are sizes, and lower ureter also, if more than seven millimeter, it has to be uh, uh, treated by the uh, surgeons. And uh, then, then there is no role of forced alkaline diuresis, uh, specifically in very young children. However, if there are small small stones and which are not causing uh, so much of obstruction and hydronephrosis, hydroureter uh, proximally, then it can be tried uh, for a little older children. Again, you know, yeah, we would hardly ever do, you know, post alkaline yes. diuresis because it's not required. Just maintain hydration and just let them take enough fluids. And uh, uh, and we uh, at our center, we don't use the medical expulsive therapy, but I think our urologists use. So if you have to use the drug, what agent do you use, Eliza, for the for the for the the, the alpha blockers? Do you use prezosin? So uh, again, at the medical side, we are not using it. It is basically by the urologists that they're doing it, but they are using tamsulosin in some patients. Tamsulosin. Yes. Okay, so you would be using tamsulosin. At our center also, sir, they use tamsulosin. Tamsulosin. Okay. Yeah. So so one can theoretically give it, you know, but for these would be limited chiefly for stones that are in the lower ureter, in which you assume, you know, that the by taking the, by dilating the sphincter, the stone would move down. Overall, we think, you know, that stones that are below 5 millimeter would would generally get expelled on their own, you know, and we don't seem to worry too much. So be, below 5 millimeter, one would not do too much. Is there an upper cutoff, uh, Eliza or can re, either of you, for ESWL? So what stones are the best to be removed by, by shockwave lithotripsy? So usually the smaller stones, like I said in that uh, in that flow chart, usually less than 15 millimeter stones would be better amenable to an ESWL. A larger stone, better to go for a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Yeah, so generally I think below 2 centimeters. Overall, I think you should go with a rule that a bit less than 2 centimeters. Although there are some people who would say that they can even take care of bigger stones by ESWL, but 2 centimeters is perhaps uh, the, the larger ones. Uh, otherwise, they would do one of the other procedures, you know. Uh, the other thing, you know, at times we tend to, uh, and I don't know what's been your experience, Kenry, as well as Eliza, that when you're doing ultrasounds, you know, at times you one tends to overdiagnose stones. You know, any any anything that looks a bit calcific gets labeled a stone, particularly on an ultrasound. So one should be careful, you know, and if you doubt have, do it again. Do it after a few days or a few weeks again, you know, uh, because. Uh, Ultrasound can clearly overdiagnose stones at times, and where where you are really in doubt, there you do a spiral, so a non-contrast spiral CT. That would really be the procedure of choice. Uh, Eliza, what's your feeling? So usually the opposite happens. Uh, a patient who's presented with colic, they are usually not able to pick up the stone, and then you have to go for a CT. But uh, yes, th that is a problem, sir. especially with very small one, two millimeter gravel is sometimes reported and then we don't know whether what to do with it, whether to go for an evaluation or not. So in those patients, we just advise them adequate hydration and um, call them back after, let's say, four to six weeks and look for uh, a proper ultrasound through a proper, you know, a pediatric uh, person who is doing pediatric ultrasounds with us. 
So that is how we try to sort that out. So uh, again, Eliza, can you answer this? What are the disorders which can be picked up on metabolic evaluation? Specific disorders, just try to, so you've already discussed them, you know, just list them again for the participants. So uh, uh, the most common disorder that we pick up is the hypercalciuria. So the hypercalciuria per se itself could be because of so many conditions like the tubular disorders, it could be an idiopathic hypercalciuria and so on. And then we can look for the uric acid related disorders. So we can have hyperuricosuria or uh, hypo uh, with, with, hypo, uh, with low uric acid in the serum like xanthinuria, which can be suspected, but later on confirmed only by a stone analysis or a genetics. Uh, we can also suspect uh, hyperoxaluria if we can get a good urinary oxalate. Plasma oxalates are a little difficult to do in our uh, setup because the values are the, the most of the labs are not doing it. But uh, again, in a patient who has got a history of recurrent stones or a family history of stones and comes up with a value of a high plasma oxalate like 99 or 100, it should definitely be a pointer towards uh, uh, hyperoxaluria. And uh, and then we have hypocitraturia, which itself is an inhibitor of stone formation. So if citrate itself is low, it is an indicator that that is probably the metabolic abnormality. So the best idea is to go with the, the flowchart that I had discussed. We pick up one of those five different, uh, the different etiologies and then go with whether the calcium is high, the pKH is low or whatever is the combination and look for the various disorders that, was, that were discussed. Okay, um, Kennedy, uh, just one yes. question to you. You had one patient with pH, pH type 3. Now, yes, uh, why was a urinary auxiliary not done? You know, it should have been done. Sir, How else was, did you figure out? Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, the, it was in from 2019, and that time uh, it was uh, uh, not available in our hospital, and patient was very uh, poor. But however, uh, genetic is available in our uh, hospital, so it was okay. done. Yes, sir. Yeah, and also that's parents that's were parents were sir, not willing for the child to, because we wanted to mainly see hypercalciuria and uh, they were not willing for the catheterization and admission. Because before we make you know diagnosis like agree, uh, agree, sir. PA, PA3, you know, and uh, another problem that we face at least this is a message for participants that when you are evaluating uh, for for hyperoxaluria number one, this is the only condition in which you need to take urine and hydrochloric acid, so you can't use the standard bottles. Yes. So you have to use the, the I think it's the 5N or point or whatever the uh, normality of HCL. So the urine has to be collected in um, auxiliary bottles uh, in hydrochloric acid. Uh, and it has to be then uh, transported and processed by the lab. You don't need to freeze it or anything. But the important point is, you know, that at times you may get hyperoxaluria. The commonest cause is not primary hyperoxaluria. The commonest cause is usually some kind of a secondary cause or absorptive or something, you know, or there is a enteric hyperoxaluria. Because at times, you know, we have made we have made mistakes, you know, we have picked up hyperoxaluria on one report and on the second report, a few weeks later, it's normal. So it's important to be aware about this thing. So, but again, there is no, there is no option on not doing a 24 hour. I think one should try to, whenever you're getting stones, always aim for a 24 hour. You can use spots samples, but 24 hours is clearly better, you know, and one would at least do a calcium creatinine protein oxalate. I think these three, these four things would be essential. I don't think phosphate and sodium help very much in the diagnosis. Uh, but at, but these three, four things uh, would perhaps, Eliza, uh, so what, if you do a 24 hour, what things are clearly important? Uh, because, uh, yeah. So, sir, so there is uh, actually in our hospital 24 hour urinary assessments, the evaluations they are being done in house. And since it is so cumbersome to do a 24 hour collection, I rather go for all the investigations in one go. Like once you have collected a 24 hour sample, we go for a protein, calcium, creatinine, so that's so just to assess its adequacy. And uh, along with that, at least a uric acid. And then a second collection for oxygen. Uh, since yeah, 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 yeah. Uric acid is as important. Sorry, I forgot yes. uric acid. And so these are uh, absolutely important. Since we are already collecting a 24-hour sample, we also do electrolytes, although it should be done on a spot sample, but then uh, the lab asks for a 24-hour sample. We do electrolytes simultaneously so that we can look at the sodium-potassium ratios and the urinary and ion gap in case uh, there is an incomplete RTA sort of a thing. So just to complete the workup, uh, we do electrolytes as well. But again, the most important things that we do are the calcium, protein, creatinine, uric acid, and a separate collection for oxalate and citrate. 
Yeah, and as uh, Eliza had said, you know, be ready to at least do tests twice or thrice. Never rely on a single set of values uh, because, uh, yeah, we, there could be errors. Uh, the last question, Kinnari, to, to yes. you, last two questions. One patient had normal, normal urinary oxalate, but genetic analysis showed oxaluria. Who was patient? No, she had, I think she or he had a patient had normal urinary oxalate. But genetic analysis showed not uh, uh, oxalate. This is the whole, no, but the, but we never did the oxalate here. The patient that you reported. Yeah, we have never done it, sir. We didn't do yeah. it uh, urinary oxalate for the child. Okay, so so, so the, maybe the participant is asking that the that she or he had normal urinary oxalate, but genetic analysis showed oxaluria. It's odd, you know, uh, yeah. because normally uh, the urinary oxalate should be high. Uh, always remember, you know, the genetic studies. Are, are unless they are showing you a clearly pathogenic or a likely pathogenic variant, they are they have their own errors. You know, don't don't overread genetic reports, and it should be read in in relation to the clinical phenotype. So uh, you can't have you know uh, pH one with normal urinary oxalate. So there could be two errors. One is that the urine was not collected properly. So you would again do a urinary oxalate. But one would probably look at the genetics report more carefully. It will be us thani, you know. Very often we are overdiagnosing conditions based on variants of unknown significance. One more question, uh, Kenry, for you: In routine urine analysis, if there is a presence of oxalate crystals, does it require detailed evaluation in the absence of nephrolithiasis? So the patient has no stones, but the urine shows oxalate crystals. Do they require evaluation? So this patient should be well hydrated first and then to do repeat uh, urine examination, you may not find in the next examination oxalate crystals. I absolutely agree with you. So uh, with the, these things can occur even normally. So ensure hydration, ensure that uh, the patient, and I would not worry too much, you know, I don't think we need to do a de detailed evaluation. So I'd like and, to add uh, yeah, Eliza. Yeah. At the same time, sir, if you are getting urinary uh, oxalate crystals in repeated urinary examinations, in that case, it becomes important that we do start taking it uh, seriously that uh, even after hydration, if the oxalate crystals are there or at multiple locations, we are finding that, yes, oxalate crystals are there, we should look for auxiliaria, whether it is secondary or primary. But why are we examining the urine? You know, the patient is asymptomatic. So, any age specific nomograms for urine electrolytes? There are nomograms, and you can look at any textbook, you know. And there are nomograms for spot, there are nomograms for 24 hour, but not for electrolytes, you know. Electrolytes can nomogram, you know, electrolytes, urine, sodium, potassium depend a lot.